is everybody? Great. Everybody is good. Got a little breeze today, praise God. Amen. Not as hot, humidity's down a little. Praise the Lord. You ready to worship the Lord this morning? <laughs> Let's do that.
We know God's name is power. We know His name is healing. You just heard an example of that this morning. And don't you dare call that coincidence. What would make a person fall on their face and give their life to Jesus Christ? What would do that? Powerful preaching. Powerful music. Jesus. Only the Spirit of God draws people to Himself. Only the Spirit of God changes a heart in a day. Amen and amen. God bless you. Worship team is too quickly. So, before a while Tim's coming up, I, I want to mention to you a couple of things, or one thing that happened this week. Um, we are on schedule to begin work in a few weeks, and a uh, week from tomorrow. Uh, we, uh, we have fit, uh, a little bit of, we have money for the next draw in our account. And so rather than waiting on a letter from uh, our, our insurance to say, hey, the money's there, it's coming, we don't know, rather than wait on that, uh, I, mentioned, I mentioned it to the contractors, they said, well, if you've got the next draw, which we do, and it's been paid, uh, then they're going to go ahead and start working, I said, and hopefully, and prayerfully, by the time they're done with that work, then by the, by the time they're done with that work, then... Uh, we'll be able to move right into the next phase because we'll have the rest of the money. Okay. So that's what's going to happen. The electrician's coming a week from tomorrow. This week, coming week, they'll be coming. Crews will come and clean things up some because it needs to be, as well as get rid of the dumpster and put a fresh clean one in there. A couple of other things they'll be doing. And uh, I met with the audiovisual folks for about an hour and a half again this week and uh, narrowing some things down, cutting here, cutting there. And... Uh, so we're getting very, very close. So I wanted you to know that. And uh, as soon as uh, the electrician's done and the AV guys are done, which won't take long, uh, they'll start drywalling. And from that point, it'll just steamroll. It'll go very quickly. You'll be surprised. We hope. <laughs> that's, the, that's the hope. All right. End of September, the conference has called me said there's a church in Michigan, I believe, Michigan or Pennsylvania, I don't recall which it was, who's sending about seven or eight people who are fairly skilled. I mean, they're not necessarily professional con uh, carpenters, but they're fairly skilled. And they're going to be going to Miami and then over to here. Or here and then Miami, I'm not sure which. Okay. Um, and they're going to be helping us in the church. Whether, whatever we need to do. If we just clean up, throw things away. Rape, whatever, whatever we need, they're going to be here. And I'll let you know, so maybe you can come help and just generally do some cleanup uh, while the construction's going on. I'm not sure how that's going to work, to be honest with you. We'll just have to wait and see. But they are coming, and they want to stay with people in church. Like if you'd be willing to your home up for a few days, So they, so Sal just don't have them at your house, so they'll never come back. So if you're if you're open to that, um, just keep that in mind. Let me know. I don't want to put them here. I could, but it wouldn't be that comfortable for them. So just let me know, okay? You, you can house two or three or one or however many. Tim. Thank you for coming this morning. God bless you. Thank you for those of you online. You're just so faithful, all of you. And I love you. Love you much for that. Praise God, everyone. Praise God, everyone. Get a hand up here and praise God. Lord, thank you for gathering us today. One more time, Lord. We come to let your voice be heard and your words find fertile soil. Let all of these lives be gathered closer to you, Lord. 
today than we were yesterday. Let us continue, Lord, as we draw you, Lord. We thank you so much for being our God. We thank you for the mercy that you've shown each of us, Lord. Let this continue, this rebuilding of this house continue diligently, Lord, now. And we thank you. We thank you again for being our God, so merciful and kind. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen. We've got upward flag football. He's still coming. Corey and Belinda have the information for you. See them. See them. Good opportunities for the kids to come and something together in the name of Jesus. There's a disciple Bible ship studies. Bible studies. Seven, right? Bob friend is the men's group. You've heard about it before. Saturday mornings at eight. We're praying, lifting up our concerns to the Lord. He's answering prayers as we see witness here this morning. Next day. Put an extra twenty in your pocket and put an extra twenty in the second. Twenty dollars is changed from a hundred dollar bill, right? So that's spare change. Bring it along. Praise God. And uh you need to connect. You got something you want to say? Some concern that needs prayer? Let us lend a hand. Praise God. This memory verse here for this week from First Chronicles sixteen eleven. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. Reminds me that He warns us, commands us to. Press in to know Him, that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He tells us this again and again. Be aware, day in and day out, to seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. He is a rewarder. Praise God. Thank you all for listening. And uh, oh, I for the lines recycling your old used glasses. If you're out at a garage sale and you see a, a bunch of glasses sitting there and they're giving them away cheap, grab up a couple of pairs and, and get them to, uh, to Amy and Spencer. And we're continuing to collect the uh, prescription bottles week in and week out. Thank you all. God bless you. Let the will be done. Let the Lord's will be done in your life. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. to the Bible I mean, just really into it. and that's a wonderful thing discussing Bible and uh, sharing stories if you're not coming then you're missing it uh, it's on fire right now there's about 14 people there thank you and it is in the air room we're not here next door um, if we could just get Bob to shell a little we'd, we'd probably have all of you there that you would place this word in our hearts, change us for eternity. Your word is power, your word is life. And we seek the name of Jesus this morning. Anybody say, Amen. 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 You will want to talk to Corey and Melinda about the upward flag football that will be in your heart. Once you signed up more than last year. This is an outreach. This is from this church to this community. A chance to be the community. And it's just football. It's much more than that. And it's not just hot dogs or hamburgers. It's much more than that. They get prayer. And they get teaching. Okay? It's about Jesus. And what we bring them. And they have fun. What better way to teach kids, right? 
So we come to the end of Ruth, our sermon series on Ruth. And in a second, I'm going to read, and we're going to read together the, uh, the fourth chapter of Ruth. At this point, things started out looking pretty bleak, if you remember chapter 1. Naomi and, and husband Elimelech and two sons had moved to the land of Moab because there was a famine around the hometown of Bethlehem. Now the sons married Moabite women, and then Naomi's husband dies. And then two of her sons, or only two sons, die. All of that within the span of just a few years. So Naomi, as you can imagine, as you remember, was devastated, and she was convinced that God had done this, right? That God had chosen her to just inflict his grief upon her, his wrath upon her for some reason, and that she has no future. And that might be true in that uh, that part of, of the uh, culture of the Jews at the time. So she might as well, she think, in return to her home down in Bethlehem, they're not going to be happy with Bethlehem, Ephrathah, remember, is the same town where Jesus Christ was to be born. Don't forget that. So, besides the word on the street at this point was that the famine was over in uh, Bethlehem, in Judah, the region there. So, she encouraged her daughters-in-law. She said, go back to your original family. So, so they could get married again and and one does but not Ruth she is hopelessly devoted as the song goes to her mother-in-law and she leaves behind her native land Moab the language the culture and the people she goes to Bethlehem in Judah with Naomi and her gods by the way some of you have moved here from Chicago or California or North Florida, so you know what this feels like. <laughs> Move to a foreign land. So we've got these two poor women trying to eke out an existence in Bethlehem or Minnesota. But the curtain starts to, to pull back here to reveal, I think, a little more hope in each of these verses as we go along. Ends up gleaning in a field owned by Boaz. Gleaning means going behind all the pickers to get the over to wild a bowl full of stuff or a bag full of grain. Excuse me. So Boaz is really nice to Ruth. He's a good man. He's a kind man, and he gives her preferential so speak, treatment. So she ends up being a field owned by Boaz, but he gives her this press and gives her all this pain instead. He lets her have the good stuff, right? Extra food. And so Naomi, when, when Ruth gets home, Naomi slips into the matchmaker mode, into the yenta mode, as Jews would say. Nothing, no fact, I guess, that Boaz is a member of her late husband's estate. Now, he's not brother or maybe even cousin, maybe second cousin, third cousin removed, whatever. But he is in the clan. He's a kinsman. He's kin. So that means he can redeem Ruth. That is, he, uh, he is in line as a possible mate for her. I know that's a strange word to say. Now listen, ladies, this is back a long, 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 long time ago. And that was the culture then. As you know, women have much. If, if you didn't have a husband, you didn't have anything. And you were just kind of an outcast, so to speak. Maybe you live in your parents' uh, loft or something, but you weren't looked on very well. And so you had to have a man to take care of you. How many of you need a man to take care of you? It was a cultural thing. Yes, we like to have a spouse, no doubt. We need that person to uh, to be our helpmate. It's designed to be that way. It's the way God wanted it. 
a cultural thing and not necessarily a religious thing, right? So Naomi concocts a scheme whereby Ruth sneaks into where Boaz is sleeping. She lays down at his feet. This is the that she gives herself to as a potential mate. And then she proposes marriage when he wakes up. <laughs> Nothing like popping the big question, right? When someone's asleep or off guard, you just wake up and go, huh? And then the next day you go, I say, what? Right? So Boaz is startled when this happens, but it is reflected by Ruth's interest. I mean, she's a younger woman. I don't know how old he is, but he's older than her, because he tells her that. And he sends her back to Naomi with more food, telling her that there is another kinsman who is closer than he is, who by rights has first shot at her. Right? And if that man wants to take Ruth as his wife, redeeming her, redeeming her, isn't that strange word? Yeah. Redeeming the woman. No, she wasn't a value before. But now she's got a man. She means something. Her life is worth something now. I kind of like that. Just kidding. So, <laughs> so if this man doesn't take her, would take her. So she could be wet, but she obviously prefers both. So, here we go, chapter 4, verses 1 to 22. Now Boaz went up to the gate, sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz spoke, was passing by. And see, the gate was where everything happened in the city. Always that way. It was the market, it was the place where they did business, it was a place where they gossiped, and just talking about stuff. It's a place where everything took place. So you knew where to find somebody if you needed to do some business. So I says, come over here, friend. Sit down here. So they were kidding, folk. He, the man comes over, he sits down, and then he took ten men of the elders of the city. So the elders, again, were there. They're all thinking, ten of you, come over here, sit down with me. So they all sat down, and they're probably kind of used to this. And he said to the Redeemer, his kinsman, he said, Naomi, who's returned to Boaz, has to sell the blood of land which belongs to our brother Lech. As one person this week said, L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-L-M-
I don't know, but I know I had a pair of flip flops I just redeemed at the uh, shoe store in Oklahoma and uh, a different pair of shoes. But those things were so old uh, and the, 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 the rubber had worn off on the inside. I was walking on the soles and and uh, worse than that, they really started to smell because I've been stepping in all kinds of water around here and yeah, they were really bad. And so I put them in a box, a shoe box, and I bought, took the other shoes out, the new ones, put those in a box and gave it to the lady at the register and uh, left quickly because I knew I was never going to open that box. I redeemed my sandals, and I, I just can't imagine keeping one sandal and putting the other shoe back on, the new shoe on. I I, I don't know. I just strange to me. Maybe some of you can figure out why the sandal deal. So, he says, I have acquired with the boy, the will of Malon to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. So that the name of the deceased, Elimelech, will not be eliminated from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. There's no heir if there's no successor to Naomi and Elimelech. That name dies. And he says to the Gentiles, You are witnesses today. And all the people who were in the court said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make one who is coming into your home like Rachel, and both of whom are the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth and Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may also be the house of Perez who came our board of Judah to the descendants whom the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took root, and she became like And he had relations with her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you, but I'm here today. May he also be to you one who restores life. And sustains your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap, and became his nurse. And the neighbor women, the neighbor women, right, this is strange, gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations, and I think this is important here, y'all, of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. And Ram fathered Aminadab. And Aminadab fathered Nashon. And Nashon fathered Salmon. And Salmon fathered Boaz. And Boaz fathered Obed. And Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. King David. What a story! Boaz negotiates, he wants the right to marry Ruth, and through a little, you know, finagling, he angled that property and he threw Ruth in there, right? So, by the way, the take on wife was considered to be a financial burden as well. And we don't know if Boaz had other wives, likely so. So, so he would be a, yes, he would be a polygamist, wouldn't he? popular Steve. Probably still is in some areas of the country, not going to say where, but uh, so in the 60s, the hippies were becoming polygamous. Some don't remember that? Yes? No? no? So I got to thinking, Steve and I were thinking, what would a polygamist, how, how, how would a polygamist hippie count his wife? How would he count his wives? One, Mrs. Hippie. Two, Mrs. Hippie. Three, Mrs. Hippie. <laughs> Steve and Hippie will be rolling in the aisles. I was guaranteed that. And that wasn't the delivery that I gave. <laughs> We couldn't wait. He, he came into my office in such a rush and in a sweat to tell me this joke. Well, thank you, 
Steve. It was better than mine, I have to admit. So, anyway, Boaz went out, went out of his way to show mercy to Ruth. And in doing so, became her redeemer. And the outcome of his actions had some really extensive ripple effect, didn't it? Which is exactly what the writer of Ruth wants to see here today. He ran the whole thing with this awesome genealogy. More that we're going to get to in a minute. But when I surveyed this entire book of Ruth, there are four outcomes I want you to check this morning to this story. The first outcome is marriage. Okay. Ruth gets a man. She's a husband. And she had not lost any husband. He was a great husband. He was a great man. And probably not famous in his era, but and not a war hero, but and not a team, and not a giant business problem. But it's quite a different way. He had here, hear this. He had more influence in the direction of the nation of Israel than hundreds of famous people there in the Bible. Say like nothing of the joy and the security that he brought to Ruth and to Naomi. Boaz is a great model guy for husbands. So, so much of what you as people, we we angle for more of this or more of that, even in our marriage relationship. Most things uh, about figuring out how to compromise. Okay, but this is not all picture here you get with Boaz. Everything you see in Boaz is that he is a man who lived outside of himself. He was one of those that I talked about last week who gave himself. He didn't give up himself. He gave up himself. He was driven by a sense of compassion and mercy and love for God. Even in taking root, she cost him plenty. He paid a lot of money. And from her perspective, maybe she was even barren. She, he thought maybe. He didn't know. She didn't have any children up to this point. She'd been married before. So that means the chances of her having a son, maybe to Boaz, were fairly slim. But he was doing the right thing. She was his kinsman. So there probably wouldn't be much return on this marital relationship investment. So don't think for one minute he was thinking that, oh, I'll get the land. <laughs> yeah. Well, it cost him a lot more than that. So the second outcome of the story, first is marriage. The second one is motherhood. Naomi gets a son in verses 14 and 15. And the women of the uh, the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today. And may the son of yours restore be a Redeemer as well, so to speak. And then in verse 16, Naomi could take care of the baby. Naomi has a baby to take care of now. She's a grandma, so to speak. She's watching after this little baby. More literally, in the Bible, it means she nursed it. She nursed the baby, so to speak, nursing it. And the neighbor women said, Now at last, Naomi's got a son again, and they named him Obed. Again, remember, this is basically come her son, because it's going to take her name, her lineage. The neighbor women said, Now at last, she has a son. And I, I, I thought that was interesting that the neighborhood women named the child. I haven't seen that in Scripture before. Perhaps it's there. But most of the time, the, the, maybe the priest will name him, but the parents typically do. Uh, so, again, this story started out uglier than a burnt boot. I mean, it was bad. Uglier than a burnt boot, Bob. Naomi had no one left. Her husband and her son were dead. It seemed like God was in her. had Ruth. Someone does it. What can you do with them? That's a big difference. She came and said, Your God is going to be my God. God does not reject those who accept Him. But again, they had a wonderful son through Ruth to carry on the family name and to care for her. Folks, God provides. God provides. And then the third outcome is that Israel gets a king. Israel gets a king. They had judges up to this point. And then along comes Saul, and then comes David. So 
So he became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David, Obed did. Now all of this despair to joy really had a deeper significance than first catches our eye here, I think, in this story. See, it was through that line of Ruth and Boaz and King David, by the way, the greatest king in all of Israel, came to be, and this is of no little significance in the story, blocking his plan through his chosen people. It was through David that the nation of Israel was established. It was not just a, a loosely kind of confederate about Ruth and Boaz being the great grandparents of David I want you to hear this the fourth outcome is that the world gets a redeemer the world gets a redeemer Matthew chapter 1 now here we go stay with me here because this is uh, this is this is paramount okay hang with me Salmon was the father of Boaz his mother was Rahab Boaz was the father of Obed his mother was Ruth Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. He was the father of Solomon. His mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abiah. Abiah was the father of Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Man, how many of us can go back that far? Just that far. So that, that lends such significance, for one thing, this lineage. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah the father of Manasseh. Manasseh the father of Manasseh. There's some famous names in there. Famous Amos. Amos was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah the father of Manasseh. Manasseh the father of Amos. Amos the father of Josiah. Josiah the father of Jehoiachin and his brothers born at the time of exile to Babylon. After the Babylon exit, Jehoiachin was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abayu. Abayu was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Eliu. Eliu, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Or, yeah, Mathan. Or Nathan, if you're from the south. Was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, the Messiah. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you think that you lead an inconsequential life. Don't ever think that. Don't ever stop doing the Lord's will. This is really the postscript to the story. Jesus, the Redeemer of the world. God in the flesh. The Savior. The one who died to take away the sins of the world. The one through whom we relate to God and have relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He too. He too in the line of Ruth and Boaz. A redeemer. A redeemer of all mankind. Not just a family. However, it is a family who takes us into his family, doesn't he? Do you see the correlation here? When we acknowledge him as Savior and ask him to become, we ask him to become our redeemer, we, there's that redeemer word, he redeems us. We were outside of him, outside of the will of God, we were doomed to a life of nothingness, just like Ruth and Naomi. And He redeemed us from that, but He also provides eternity for us. That's something the other redeemers could not do. 
So when you see Christ, when you hear of him called the Redeemer, you'll have a better idea of exactly more what that means than simply the word itself. He redeemed me from my sins. And God is, he paid the price, by the way. There was a price for that. When you redeem something, there's a price. And God has been at work in the world from ages and ages past. And truly, I believe God is sovereign. This is really what the storyteller in Ruth wants us to see. That God is sovereign. That He is in control of history. He takes the negatives. He takes the mistakes that we make. The encounters. The missteps that we all make. Weaving all of those strands together to work out a beautiful tapestry of His plan. Redeeming His world. And he's still at it. He's still using people. And the hard times you and I face every day. Even if you're not really listening to me. Even if you're not really close to God at this point. He's still at work in your life. He's still calling. He's still, calling. He's still shaping ever so slowly. And molding. And reforming. His plan to be conformed into His image. What a Redeemer we have. He prepares you to accomplish the next part of His plan. Listen, you may feel like, I'm not really in God's plan. Well, then ask Him to help you discover that. However, live your life for Him in the meantime. Live the way He's called you to live. And when you feel like you're just in this rut and in this thing, just remember, God's shaping you in the middle of that because the next thing's coming. You see, you may feel like your plan is way over here and you're way back here. Well, to get from here to there, it's not a straight line. There's some shaping to take place. Right? How many of you, I could ask everyone, if you do the same thing. What brought you here to this point in your walk with Jesus? was a bumpy road and it was crooked sometimes and you had to be shaped and reformed and you were ready for the next thing not the end yet maybe not the big goal maybe not the big thing yet but just being faithful in those little things every day and, and going through the trials and tribulations and the next thing you know you're the glorious creature. And you don't even know it. You're not standing for this. You ain't going to stand in front of the mirror the day of your death and go, boy, I finally made it. Look at me. I am a glorious creature. I, I finally look like God and I, I, I'm I finally blessed God. I got all my badges and I'm exactly where I need to be. That ain't going to happen. Keep going. Keep fighting. Keep being shaped. Keep being molded. Keep being faithful. I hear key point this morning. Redemption happens because God is sovereign. Not just in dealing with chosen people, the Jews, alright? But people working through us. They're foreigners. The Bible says we're strangers in a foreign land. Listen, Ruth was a Moabite, not originally a part of the chosen, but because she chose to be a part of what God was doing, she was used by God in an incredible way. Do you get that? By the way, she was not one. I think there are at least four foreigners, non-Jews, in the genealogy of Jesus. One of the other prominent foreign figures was Rahab. Remember her? She was the prostitute who protected the Israelite spies who had come to scope out Jericho. Rahab ended up marrying a guy named Salmon. Salmon and Rahab were the parents of Boaz. <laughs> See, God was... I just like to have a guy named Salmon, by the way. God was using foreigners even then to bring about his you ever feel like you're a, a, an outsider, a foreigner, at work, school, wherever? 
Well, good. You should. Everyone else seems to be connecting maybe to God, but you? Welcome to Moab. We're all there at one time or another. But here's the good news. God still does His thing even through the lives of Moabites like you and I at one time or another. And here's the good news. He does His thing even through the lives of Moabites. Trust Him. Trust Him. Amen? Would you stand, please? Father, in Jesus' name, being a Moabite is not the best feeling in the world, God. But Lord, we are Moabites in this world. And there's no greater feeling than knowing our salvation is secure in you, Jesus Christ. There are those this morning who feel outcast, maybe even estranged from you. God, I pray you would draw them near. That you would show them today their worth and their value to you. That you love them. You've redeemed them. And there are those here today who maybe don't feel redeemed and never have been. Never said, Jesus Christ, I accept you into my heart as Lord and Savior. God, would you do that this morning? Would you invite them to invite you into their hearts? Change us all, God, for eternity. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you're here this morning before we leave and, and you'd like to talk to me or set up a time with me, whatever, talk to me this morning. I, I'll be here. Talk to me about Christ. Please, I, I'm available to you. Okay, I want to make myself available to you. So if you'd like to know who Jesus Christ is, you'd like to invite him into your heart, it's not hard. We can take care of that very quickly. All right, and then we'll help you walk that road. We always leave with a shout. We always shout. We leave. The Bible says, lift up your voice with a shout. Right. Roger, yeah. you are more than a conqueror through Jesus who loves you. Hi, you are more than a conqueror through Jesus who loves you. Even if your golf game is in the toilet. <laughs> and I love you very, very much. And I thank you and appreciate you so much. So we're going to say hallelujah on three. Ready? One, two, three.